Now, our next reader is Robert Swore, Sward, and he's taught at Cornell University, the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and University of California at Santa Cruz, a place that you really would want to go to, I must say. A uh, Guggenheim Fellow, he was chosen by Lucille Clifton to receive a Villa Montalvo Literary Arts Award. Renhead Renhen Press published Sword's new and selected poems, a work called from Sword's more than 50 years of writing, including previously unpublished poems and selections from his 20 plus plus books of poetry. Chicago born, a US Navy veteran, he lives now in Santa Cruz, California with his wife, visual artist, Gloria K. Alford. And I'll say that I met uh, Robert Sward at AWP at a reception, and um, he sat down, and we started talking, and he said, here's my book, and I opened it, and I read a poem of his that was so amazing, and I thought, how could I not have heard of this man before? This is so wonderful. So I knew immediately that I had to ask him to come and read at the Poetry Center, because when I find a poet whose work seems to me to be so alive and truth-telling, I want to share it with you guys. So let's welcome Robert Sward. Well, I've been looking forward to this for some months and uh, really moved by Jan's reading. I mean, it's, it's traditionally, they say, it's hard, hard act to follow, and truly is. For me, c can you hear me okay back there? Right, that up? Yeah. yeah. How's that? Totally much taller yeah. than Jan. <laughs> How's that? John? Yes, you can continue talking and I can okay. use the mic. Okay. For me, I know I'm really getting something out of a poetry reading when I'm following every single line, every single word, every single phrase. In a good reading, you know, I might get this three or four times, but with uh, Jan's reading today, I got every line. And it's, it's not my skill, it's just her material. Um, and I want to thank Maria, and I want to thank the people who were in my workshop today. <clears throat> so I'll be reading from two works. One will be the uh, Newman Selected Poems, the Red End Press book, and then a manuscript that I'm just now completing called Unleashed. Can you hear me on the back? Is that, yeah, good. So the new book is going to be called Unleashed, The Dogs in My Life. And uh, as an epigraph, um, what does it mean to be a dog in 21st century America, 15,000 years after these animals, a subspecies of the gray wolf, first began to be domesticated? Um, I'm a lover of dogs, and uh, it amazes me to think that you know, poodles, shih tzus, German shepherds, all derived from one particular animal, and that was the wolf. Uh, I have a, a, a few lines from Marianne Moore, which, which I've never forgotten. America, where there are no proofreaders, no silkworms, no digressions, the wild man's land, grassless, linkless, languages, country in which letters are written, not in Spanish, not in Greek, not in Latin, not in shorthand, but in plain American, which cats and dogs can read. <laughs> and that's what I aspire to do. So I have a dog narrator, a dog persona, and uh, the dog is called Shelby, the real dog. And its poem is called, In a World of No. Kafka writes, all that I cared for was the race of dogs, that and nothing else. To whom but dogs can one appeal in the wide and empty world? And the dog talks. In a world of no, dogs are a yes. 68 million dogs in America, and they understand there's a fundamental human reaction to everything, and it's no, no. Brr. Dogs hate hearing shit like that. People. <laughs> It's all no, and no, and no. They look at a dog sometimes, and the dog is on his back, say, on someone's lawn, legs in the air, rolling and bouncing, 
This is the hand I was dealt. I'm a dog, says the dog. It's not a problem. But people, look at me. I don't have time for this, you're thinking? Something better is going to come later? No, no it won't. Ram Dass says, this is all there is. This is all you get. All knowledge, the totality of all questions and answers is contained in the dog. Do you know who said that? Kafka. That's right, Kafka. Bow wow, bow wow, bow wow, bow wow now. <laughs> Another in the, the voice of Shelby, the world according to Shelby. The dog says, now shut up, shut up and let me bark. For starters, food has a way of anchoring thought. I'll tell you that. The stomach and the heart, they're the same things. But I want to know, after 10,000 years of domestication, what does it mean to be a dog anymore? Of course, 90% of our genetic makeup is the same as yours. I read, I read shit like that. You need, you think I need, need what? An interspecies relationship? Give me a bow, give me a wow, give me a bow wow wow. Remember, your woof woof is connected to your bow wow. Be cool, love like war. Winner is who stays longer. You know, sometimes it's just good to hang out with your own kind. <laughs> And this is Shelby on the purpose of dogs. It's about six or seven lines. Charles Darwin said, the difference in mind between man and the higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree and not of kind. And I'm thinking, why, why, why are we talking about ourselves as higher animals as opposed to you know, dogs and sheep and camels? So anyway, the dog says, 90% of our genetic makeup is the same as yours. But you, my friend, 22 feet from your mind, I better start that again. 90% of our genetic makeup is the same as yours. But you, my friend, 22 feet from your mouth to your anus. It's all right, kid. Dogs understand. They know what it means to be human. Still, the doctor who said the purpose of dogs is to stimulate the subcortical reward system, that doctor needs a doctor. The purpose of dogs is for you to walk around after us with a little bag. <laughs> and just a couple more from this uh, selection. This is called Interspecies Healing, a Specialty. And the dog says, so what is consciousness? 75% of the brain consists of water. The surface of the earth, 75% water. And a banana, too, 75% water. You and your melancholia. You know what it is? A brain? A salty tissue and membrane soup. Woof, fucking woof. <laughs> I'm not the dog I was. And you, well, you're not the dog you were either. <laughs> but brains you got, three pounds, you people. 100 billion neurons, 1.6 pints of blood, flow through the brain every minute. Problem with you now is you live in the past. You've got one oscillation for the frequency. We got another. You know, dogs are never away, are they? But you, tell me, you think God is present in you one way and in me another? Look at me. If you have eyes, you have feelings. And what do they call it? Interspecies healing. You want to get better? You're getting better. It's the idea of, of dogs as, as, uh, as healers. So I'm going to switch to some poems from, from this volume. And, um, this is a poem that Garrison Keillor read uh, on Writer's Almanac. I've long been a fan of hearing poems read out, uh, out loud. It's good being here. It's good being in New Jersey. I've been living in Santa Cruz now for more than 25 years. And every now and then I need to, you know, to get out. <laughs> yeah. Art supports the fitting. My dad was uh, born in Russia more than 100 years ago and uh, moved to the States from Russia. And the name, the name Swarlov became Sword at the Ellis Island. And, uh, 
he was brought up Orthodox Jewish, and later in life, after some you know mishaps, uh, including my mother's death, uh, he became a Rosicrucian, and stayed with that for the rest of his life, which is maybe 30 or 40 years of, of that. And I have a book that's called uh, Rosicrucian in the Basement, where my dad would, uh, in a very conservative neighborhood, he's a podiatrist, he's a foot doctor, uh, in order to practice Rosicrucianism, he would go into the basement and light incense and burn candles and convert uh, lead into gold. And so it was, it was a nice profession. So this is called Art Supports, The Fitting. Greets me in the waiting room, father with waxed five eyelid shoes, son too with spit shine five eyelid shoes. This is how I was brought up. I do it to show respect. Value your feet. Okay, unsock those feet of yours, he says. Let me see the thorns. I unlace my floor shimes, moist feet emerging from a cave of leather. Father holds up art supports, curved, knight, curved knife in his hand as he shakes his head and trims just so. Remind me, why do I need these things, I ask. Weak ankles and spine, he says. Poor posture. Your feet are fine. Truth is, you should be more like your feet. Robust feet, healthy feet. Take a lesson from your feet, he says. Feet appreciate custom made. No Dr. Schulz for these feet. Slips in the inserts, art support like a shoe inside a shoe, leather inside leather. Every step I take, you're gonna be there, I say. Every step, he says, every step of the way. And I uh, had an earlier book called God is in the Cracks. Um, and that's how the light gets in. It's, 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 a, it's a paraphrase of what uh, Leonard, Co Leonard Cohen saw. Um, God is in the Cracks. So again, it, it's, it's the Father speaking. And uh, the Father says, just a tiny crack separates this world from the next, and you step over it every day. God is in the cracks, foot propped up, nurse hovering, phone ringing. Relax and breathe from your heels. Now that's breathing. So tell me, have you enrolled yet? Enrolled in the Illinois College of Podiatry? Dad, I have a job, I teach. Ha, well, I'm a man of the lower extremities. Dad, I'm 43. So what, I'm 80. I knew you before you began wearing shoes. <laughs> Too good for feet, he asked. I, me, mind. That's all I get from your poetry. Your words lack feet. Forget the mind. Mind is all over the place. There's no support. You want me to be proud of you? Be a footman. Here, son, he says, handing me back my shoes. Try walking in these, art supports. Now there's a subject. Someday you'll write about art supports. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to read maybe one or two more. I can see some of you are chomping at the bit because you want to come up and do readings of your own. <laughs> I, just, I just, just have that feeling. Okay, this is my first poem, my first published poem, the title of my first book. It's called Uncle Dog, the Poet at Nine. And this one is, uh, it seems to me everything I've read today has been in the voice either of a dog or of my father. Um, this one is in the voice of me, and it's in the voice of myself as, at age nine. And again, the voice is carrying okay in the back. I can't tell, I'm just a little hoarse. Uncle Dog, the poet at nine. I did not want to be old Mr. Garbage Man, but Uncle Dog, who rode sitting beside him. Uncle Dog had always looked to me to be truck-strong, wise-eyed, a cur-like ford of a dog. I did not want to be Mr. Garbage Man because all he had was cans to do. Uncle Dog sat there, me beside him, empty nothing, barely even looking from garbage side to side, like rich people in the back seats of chauffeur cars, only shaggy in an unwagging, tall, scrawny way. Uncle Dog belonged any just where he sat, 
but old Mr. Garbage Man had to stop at every single can. I thought I did not want to be Mr. Everybody calls them that first. A dog is said dog or by name. I would rather be called Rover than Mr. and sit like a tough, smart mongrel beside a garbage man. Uncle Dog always went to places unconcerned, without no hurry, independent like some leashless toot, honorable among scavenger can-picking dogs, and with a bitch at every other can, and meat his for the barking. Oh, I wanted to be Uncle Dog, sharp, high, fox-eared, curve-forward, truck-faced, with his pick of the bones, a doing truckman's dog, and not a simple child dog, nor friend to man, but an uncle traveling into himself and a bitch at every second can. <laughs> and I'm going to finish up with a poem called Turning 60. Truth is, I've just recently turned 80. And, uh, It seems to me that as people go from 20 to 30, you know, 29 to 30, 39 to 40, 49 to 50, you know, it's uh, each experience is, uh, is uh, milestones. And uh, I saw uh, my uh, mother-in-law, uh, who's 92, and she was saying that uh, turning 90 was not much of a problem, but turning 91. <laughs> That was, <laughs> that was really hard. <laughs> so I wrote a poem for myself, turning 60, hard to believe, um, but it was that long ago. A poem called Turning 60, it has a little epigraph. The first 40 years of life, give us the text. The next 30 supply the commentary on it. That's from Schopenhauer. And uh, turning 60, um, I had to turn to be the sort of person I am to books. The book I turned to in this case was Struck and White's Elements of Style. As an English teacher, I mean, where else are you going to go? Grammar as hymnal, seeking solace, seeking solace for the change in age. Seeking solace in a review of grammar, I turned to Strunk and White's Elements of Style. Standing at attention, opening to the section on usage, I chanted and sang, uniting my voice with the voices of others, the vast chorus of the lovers of English. We sing a verb tense, past, present, and future. We sing the harmony of simple tenses. We lift our voice in praise of action words, and the function of verb tense. We sing of grammar, which is our compass, providing as it does clues as to how we might navigate the future. At the same time, it illuminates the past. As a teacher, I talk, that's present. For 30 years as a teacher, I talked, that's past. It may only be part-time, but I will talk, that's future. And then the very last section is called Living the Future Perfect. I will have invoked the muse. I will have remembered to give thanks, knowing our origins are in the invisible, and that we once possessed boundless energy, but we're formless, and that we are here to know the things of the heart through touching. I will have remembered, too, that there is only one thing we all possess equally, and that is our loneliness. I will have loved. You will have loved. We will have loved. Thank you.